Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, no matter where you are on the globe today, and welcome to um, the session this morning from I Know on team meetings that don't suck, something which made me smile, avoid retrospective anti-patterns, certainly something we're all keen uh, to learn about. And we're joined today by I Know Corey from Denmark, actually, so uh, true global conference today, and we're glad that you can join us today, I Know. Hello, everybody. Uh, I wish I was in India right now, not just because of the weather, which I'm sure is nicer than the very cold Denmark, but also because you have such cool earrings. Looking very much forward to going there again and getting more earrings. So today I'm going to talk about team meetings that don't suck uh, with the help from retrospective anti-patterns. And uh, the way that I learned about retrospectives was, I think, 15 years ago at a conference with Linda Rising. She talked about retrospectives and she gave me this book, Project Retrospectives by Norm Kurth. So I read this book and I found it, it fantastic. And if you don't have it, you should, you should try and get a hold of it. It's difficult, but you still can. And that really encouraged me to start facilitating retrospectives uh, just with the team that I was working with at the Danish IT company. But then I started facilitating retrospectives for our customers. And now for the past 10 years, I've been an independent consultant and I'm actually mostly facilitating retrospectives. Uh, I also had a chance to, uh, to give a course together with Diana Larson who wrote the Agile Retrospectives in 2006. And this book is fantastic if you're facilitating any retrospectives because it gives you a very good introduction to what you need to do, how you should prepare and what you should be um, wary of. And then, of course, the reason why I'm doing this talk is because I wrote this book called Retrospective Anti-Patterns, uh, which shows all the things that I did wrong in my 15 years as a facilitator and what I did to, um, to remedy it. So if, if you want to learn from my experiences with the retrospectives, you could, you could read this book. So I'm going to go through six of the retrospectives from the book today. And my goal with this talk, I'm, I'm always trying to tell people um, why they should spend these 45 minutes. Because when you're on your deathbed and you're thinking, I only have 45 minutes left. If only I hadn't seen this talk with Aino, I, I would have more time. So what's the reason why I'm spending time listening to this talk right now? It's because I want your developers to look like this when they hear this, it's retrospective time. So they, they're not trying to run away. They're actually really happy that it's retrospective time. They're like, yay, that's what we're going to do now. So that that's my aim. Um, to enable you to make retrospectives that, that people really appreciate and do not feel is a waste of time. But first I want to say what I mean by anti-patterns and what I mean by retrospectives because some people misunderstood these terms. So first off, a pattern that you know is a literary description of experience. So it has a pattern name, which is really important for discussing uh, this solution, then it has the context and forces, the problem domain that you're in when you want to apply this solution, then you have an abstract pattern solution that can then be implemented in your particular context. And that pattern solution has benefits and consequences. Now, an anti-pattern to, um, to look at this in contrast to a pattern, it also has a name, which is equally important to have the anti-pattern name to say, are oh, we now talking, we're in this situation, we, we want to avoid this situation. It also has a context and forces. Then it has the anti-pattern solution, which is what you accidentally do because you think it's a good idea, but it turns out that the negative consequences are larger than the benefits. And then in an anti-pattern, you don't just have the bad solution described, you also have the refactored solution. So how can you get out of this situation or how can you avoid getting into this situation again? And of course, the refactored solution has benefits and consequences as well. Nothing is without consequences. So let me give you an example, because the interesting thing is that over time and in a different context and with a different technology, something that is a pattern solution somewhere can become an anti-pattern solution somewhere else. As an example, the microservices architectural pattern is a pattern solution. But in some contexts, using the microservices architectural pattern can become an anti-pattern and suddenly your architecture can start looking like this, which is a mess of microservices, which is even worse than the monolith that you had in the beginning. So the refactored solution in some of these cases 
is to say, let's go back to the monolith because actually the microservices did not apply well in this context. So you see, you have the problem, you have the anti-pattern solution, and then you have the refactored solution. If you look at patterns, then they actually, the different patterns go through a Gartner hype cycle, like the, um, also like the microservices um, pattern. It, it went through a peak of inflated expectations and everybody wanted to apply these microservices. Now we're at the throw of disillusionment where a lot of people are noticing we can't really implement these microservices well for us and it's actually worse than it was before. And then at some point it will end into that plateau of productivity where microservices as a pattern is used exactly in the right places where it should be used and not overused. So that is sort of the life cycle of patterns and anti-patterns. And the anti-patterns I'll go through today are things that I thought the anti-pattern solutions I thought were was a good idea, but then it turned out they had negative consequences and then I, I refactored them. So that's what I mean when I say anti-patterns. What do I mean when I say retrospectives? Retrospectives is a recurring meeting for a team where they share what has happened. They are appreciating what happened, both the good things and the bad things, and they appreciate each other as well. And foremost, they're learning from this. So to me, the retrospective is a recurring team meeting for the team, by the team. And it's the core of agile development. It is the essence of inspecting and adapting because what you do at a retrospective is that you're inspecting, you're looking at the situation we're at right now, and then we're trying to adapt and change things, make little experiments. And overall, to understand everything is to forgive everything. So this recurring retrospective meeting also gives you a chance to understand why things happen and then forgive other people instead of bearing a grudge and, and having... Um, having scapegoats in your team saying he always does wrong or she's always stupid, then you have this chance to really understand what went wrong and to learn and to forgive. So with those two concepts uh, at hand, I want to go through the, the six anti-patterns that I've brought. And if you want to ask questions while I'm talking, you can use the chat or the q and I'll sort of try to look at it from time to time, but there will be time at the end and Debbie will help us with the q and a if, the, if there are any questions that I haven't answered during the talk. Thank you, Debbie. So the first one I want to talk about is the Wheel of Fortune. The Wheel of Fortune is one of the anti-patterns that I see most often. Uh, and for a Wheel of Fortune, you should, as you see the little octopus there, it's, it's sort of turning a Wheel of Fortune as you would in Tivoli. And then sometimes the, the arrow hits uh, a price and sometimes the arrow hits something that's not a price. And that's the whole point of this anti-pattern is that sometimes you're lucky and you're working on the right thing and sometimes you're not. Let me take you through this. Imagine that for the data gathering, you're using these start, stop, continue posters. I, I found a picture where they're in like a wheel of fortune. Um, but normally people just have these three posters, start, stop, continue. Sometimes it's do more of, sometimes it's also do less of. And what I see often is that this is the retrospective. They say, let's, let's uh, just brainstorm on things you should start, stop and continue doing. So sometimes what comes up is that we should have more pair programming, we should have less meetings, we should stop ignoring the pull requests. And the, then because they want to rush through the retrospective, they say, great, if we want more pair programming, we'll just plan more pair programming, three days a week, three hours a day, and these people. We want less meetings, right, we'll only have two, uh, stand-up meetings instead of five, and we'll only have every other planning and every other retrospective. So we cut down on the meetings, very efficient. And to stop ignoring the pull requests, we'll make some sort of bots in our Slack conversation so that people will never forget and cannot ignore it. Right. And then that retrospective is over. And if the problem really is that people forget about pair programming and they forget about the pull requests and they actually have too many meetings, then those action points are relevant and great as a result of a retrospective. But unfortunately, what you see when you gather the data is sometimes just the symptoms of the problems and not the actual causes. So for instance, if you have this more pair programming, if you dived a little bit into the discussion about this, maybe you would see that the reason why people don't have pair programming is because they don't trust each other. Maybe there's not psychological safety. 
maybe they don't know what technology they should use to do it online, or maybe they just don't see the point. Maybe nobody has ever explained to them how this in the long run is much more efficient than just working as a sole developer. So planning to have more pair programming will not solve the underlying cause. And the same with the meetings. I have so many retrospectives where people say, we want less meetings, we have too many meetings, let's just cut down on the meetings. And if the problem is not the amount of meetings, but the quality of meetings and the thought behind the meetings, then this won't help because even though you have less meetings, they'll still be a waste of time, they'll still be frustrating. So you just need to look at the quality of your meetings. Who should you invite? Is there an agenda? Are you spending too much time? Are you thinking about what the expected result is and what you want to use that result for? Could one big meeting with a lot of people have actually become like 10 smaller meetings with less people that would be much more efficient? And stop ignoring the pull requests. Well, maybe there are other reasons for ignoring the pull requests. Maybe people don't feel that they have enough knowledge or they have the skill set to actually do that. So there can be many causes behind these things and just solving what you see in <clears throat> gathering data could, could be a waste of time because then you come up with action points that won't help you. It's like putting skin lotion on, on skin cancer. It will perhaps remove the rash, but the skin cancer is still there. And then you will have retrospectives where the same problems pop up again because the cause, the underlying cause is still there. So <clears throat> the anti-pattern here is if you just want to rush through the retrospective and as you are gathering data, you're already planning what to do. What you should do instead, the refactored solution is to go back to the basics of a retrospective and go through the five phases, setting the stage, gathering data, generating insights, deciding what to do and closing the retrospective. So, so set the stage, get ready. This is where you look at the action points from the last retrospective, you follow up on them. Did we do it? Did it have the expected effect or did it not have an effect? You ask everybody to say something because when everybody has said something, then it's easier for them to say something during the retrospective. Maybe there's a theme for the retrospective. Perhaps one of the things that we didn't have time to talk about at the last retrospective, we want to focus on that now, maybe the testing process, or could it, could it be how you're learning as a team? So setting the stage is really important also to make people feel that this is the room we're now closing and everything that happens in here will stay in here. Gathering data, this is the, sometimes I think the easiest part of a retrospective because you can use the start, stop, continue, nothing wrong with doing that or the timeline or the ship retrospective or there's so many other ways of gathering data in retrospectives that are more fun. And I think it's important to shift the way you gather data from time to time because the brain is a lazy, lazy organ. So if you constantly ask the same questions to the brain, you'll get the same answers. So, so try shifting that up a bit. And then comes the interesting thing for this anti-pattern, the generating insights. So generating insights is the part where you should be digging more into these action points. And uh, I see that there's a chat that could be digging more in details, could lead to pinpoint someone. Um, maybe I misunderstood that question. I'll come back to that later. Maybe you're talking about creating a scapegoat. So I'll, I'll, I'll resurface that one later. So generating insights with this anti-pattern is to spend more time trying to understand why these things happen. So it can just be to talk about the post-it notes. So what happened? How did we end here? It could be the five whys or the five hows. If you have something that is a recurring or a big problem that you think is very critical and you don't immediately see what is causing this, or you think that it's so complex that there are more things causing it, you could use this, um, this fishbone diagram, also called the Ishkinawa diagram. So what you do here is that you say, well, we have a problem and we put that problem at the head of the fish and then you draw this fish skeleton so the problem could, could be we have a missed deadline. I know there's a spelling error there, but it should say deadline. So we have a missed deadline. And then we ask the people in the retrospective to brainstorm on, okay, so how, how could we, um, what, could, what could have caused this to happen? What could the causes be? And then people maybe say, well, we missed the deadline because of a poor prioritization. We, we didn't prioritize and we didn't reprioritize when we learned something more. 
maybe we had too much tech debt and we had too much to struggle with. It was too difficult to implement these solutions based on this technology we have. It could also be that there's no motivation, there's no celebration of the small wins. It could also be that the requirements were set too early. And of course, if you ask people to come up with these things in a brainstorm, everything is okay. So somebody might say, well, it's because the desks are too small. That might not be the real cause, but they needed to say it and it's a good time to say it. So again, when you brainstorm, then accept that it is a brainstorm and you get everything. This can, of course, also be done asynchronously. If it's an online retrospective, you can send that out prior to the meeting and people have more time to think about it and to add on to other people's courses. And the next point is deciding what to do. And there's a lot to be said about deciding what to do. We could talk about how do we actually um, decide what to talk about? What do we, how do we decide what to do in the action points? It's, is it a democratic vote? Should we use consensus or consent? We don't have time to, to go into this today but it's important to think about how you decide what to do based on what you did at the retrospective. And then the last thing is closing the retrospective, make a summary of it so that people don't afterwards walk out and say, how did we go from here to there? Who decided these action points and what are we going to get out of them? Just remind people, we talked about these things, these problems, and we celebrated these wins. And then we decided these action points or these retrospectives. And also when you close the retrospective, you should make sure that somebody's responsible for actually getting these action points or experiments done. They don't have to do all of it themselves, but some, somebody should be responsible for initiating it, for sending the first email, for setting up a meeting and for um, feeding back into the next retrospective in the follow-up and what happened. So you can see that the retrospective has these five phases and it, it fits well with the, the life of any meeting. The life of any meeting looks like this, where you start with a topic where you're in agreement and then you sort of, you open the retrospective, you talk about, um, oh, these are my experiences, this is more data, this is what I thought about. So you, you, you're in the divergence phase and then you're in the grown zone where people are discussing and and trying to figure out, oh, is this good? Is this good? Maybe this works, maybe this doesn't work. And then in the end, you're, you have to converge the retrospective or any meeting into something where you have a decision, you have some sort of conclusion. In, in a retrospective, it will be one, two or three action points or experiments. In other meetings, it might be, we need a follow-up meeting or this is what we decided to do. So in some teams, you will, you will see that that it's easy to go into the divergence, but once they're in the grown zone, they want to stop and they want to jump into the convergence again, because if they're developers, they're trained to come up with solutions. So whenever they see a problem, they want to find a solution immediately. And that's how, as a facilitator, you need to keep this grown zone open. And that's what you do in the generating insights phase. You're saying, we're not talking about solutions right now. If you have a proposal, please keep it in, in mind, put it down on a post-it notes. If it's an online retrospective, maybe you can have somewhere to put the proposals outside of the viewpoint of other people so that people have a chance to get it out of their brains so they can work in the grown zone, but we don't want to forget about it. But we don't want to jump to conclusions too early. We want to spend this time keeping this room open. So I can see that there is somebody asking, what are techniques to use in a team where most of the team are reluctant to provide inputs and what we get as data points are appreciations, but the problems are never revealed. Well, I, I hear a lot of people asking about this. How do we actually make people say something that's not just positive things? And again, we can talk about symptoms and causes because that the people won't talk about problems. That's a symptom. And then we can think about the cause. So one, one cause could be that they are worried that if they say something which is negative, it will have consequences for them. So one thing you could do there, the easy fix is to try to make it anonymous who's saying what. I'm using often a Google drawing, and I know that there's a lot of the online things like Retroom and other things where you can use um, a ways to do it anonymously. If you're doing it in real life, you can try to do it as anonymously as possible, but it's difficult if people are writing on post-it notes. So if you sense that's a big problem, maybe you should switch to an online one, even if you can do it in real life. Another thing that could cause this is, uh, is that they can't think of anything to say. They can't think of anything that is negative to say. And 
And what you could do here is that you can ask them to come up with things asynchronously before the retrospective, because maybe they need time to reflect. They can't think that fast and put things up or they've forgotten what happened in the last two weeks. So collecting things asynchronously sometimes helps. I've also seen people saying that you have to put three things that's good, three things that's bad, and three things that you're worried about or you're wondering about. Of course, that can help as well, but it's not really solving the cause. It's solving the symptoms. So they will come up with things or maybe just copy what other people did. If the cause is that they, they are worried and there's no psychological safety, no trust, that's something you could work with, but that would have to be also outside retrospective. That's not something you can fix in the retrospective. In a retrospective, you can create a relation between people, which is part of what trust is made of so you can start working on that but if there's a huge problem with that people don't want to share it's something that you need to address and work on also between the retrospectives to make it more safe to to be uncomfortable and to say uncomfortable things another thing that i do sometimes if people don't come up with things is as i said before if you ask the brain to come up with things with the same questions it'll, it'll give you the same answers so so sometimes um i say well let's have a different kind of uh, data gathering. So sometimes instead of just having free free form writing on post-it notes, I use this, um, this team radar where I have these spokes that says, what's the quality of our code? What's the, um, what's the communication level like? What's the communication within the team with other team members? Uh, how happy are we working with this team? And then people put docs, dots on these spokes and they don't have to come up with things and it's also anonymous. And then you can see, okay, so on the happiness spoke, we have most people are happy, but there's a few people who are unhappy. Maybe we need to think about how we can make it better for people to work in this team, or we have a problem with the tech debt or the testing, how can we work with that? So find different ways of gathering data. Maybe they're shy, maybe they're worried, maybe they don't like uh, writing text, maybe they don't think that fast, they need reflection time. So figure out what the problem is and, and try different solutions. So somebody here is uh, proposing set up working agreement in the beginning of the retro. Yes, that's something that you can do. So maybe uh, we cannot laugh at what other people say or other working agreements like that. Um, yeah, so that was the Wheel of Fortune. And I, I better move on a bit, even though I want to answer questions because I want to go through a lot of things before I, I go back to the Q&A. So the next one I want to talk about is in the soup. And what you see here is the octopus trying to lift a weight that's too heavy for it. And the octopus here is, um, is a team. It's a picture for the team because as you know, an octopus has 60% of their brain in the tentacles and the rest in the head. And in that case, I think that uh, an octopus is, is like a team where all the team members have their own intelligence, but then they have a shared intelligence and they have to work together. So sometimes, people are discussing things in retrospectives that they can't do anything about. And that can render it a waste of time because if they continue to discuss something that other people should do or that the management should do and they can't really do anything about it, then of course it's a waste of time. They should just accept that this is something they can't change and then adapt to it. Let's dive into this. If I notice that a team does this over and over again, I introduce this soup exercise. You can also call it the circle of influence, and it's not something that's native to retro retrospectives at all. It's used in, in other ways of um, talking about problems as well. So after they've gathered data or when they have brainstormed for things to do, I say, okay, so let's put these things in this picture. The things that you as a team can do something about, let's put them in the middle. The things that you as a team can influence, let's put them in the outer circle. And outside the circle are the things that you can't do anything about. This is both interesting to use after they've gathered data, but also after they've brainstormed for um, proposals for solutions. And then I want them to reflect on it. And then I say, well, step, step back or look at it again. Don't, don't read the notes, but look at what amount of post-it notes are in the soup. Maybe you're turning this into a retrospective where you're just complaining about things that you can't change. What you should do is focus on the things that you can change right now and then try to be constructive about that. So let me give you some examples. And th these examples are taken both from after gathering data, but also um, deciding what to do. So uh, maybe you want to change the location of the company. That's in the soup. That's not something you can do anything about. 
maybe uh, the communication with the testers is bad. Well, it's something you can influence, but it's not something you can change yourself. But code review of all major changes, that's something you can't do. And the interesting thing with this is that, well, then you could just say, well, all the things that are in the do are the things that we're going to talk about, all the things we're going to do something about. But if you, like with the generating insights, if you, if you try to go into these discussions, then sometimes maybe you, you notice, well, there are things we could do as a team, we could come up with reasons for a local hub that won't change the location of the company, but maybe we can influence it. And maybe we could move closer to the testers. That's something perhaps we can do. We can make the decision about, and that might enhance the communication with the testers. So I like to use this um, circles and soup activity from time to time. And it's something that I do when I see that a team won't take responsibility, or if I see that there's something that a team continues to discuss over and over again, and they don't seem to be able to solve it. So that's called in the soup. So prime directive ignorance. And I think that goes towards one of the questions that I skipped in the beginning, that if you go and generate insights and you figure out what happened, don't you end up pinpointing somebody who was the culprit, who was the scapegoat? I think that was what the question meant. And that's why I skipped it in the, in the Wheel of Fortune. So prime directive ignorance is when you ignore the prime directive. And the prime directive is what Norm Kurth uh, wrote when he started talking about project retrospectives. And I'll let you read it while I take a sip of water. So when I started facilitating retrospectives, I wanted to talk about this prime directive when I was facilitating retrospectives, but some people at retrospectives thought it was silly and hippie happy. They said, we can't truly believe that everybody did the best they could. Now, when we know that he's an idiot and she's very lazy, we can't really believe that. Also, because I know that myself, I'm also not always doing the best I can. So how can I truly believe it for other people? So the anti-pattern solution here is to just forget about this prime directive and just not think about it anymore. But the problem is that if you do that, then you might end up in a situation where people are trying to find scapegoats, where people are trying to figure out and pinpoint whose fault it is. And it is so important for retrospectives that you at least try to have this open mindset and that you try to have this positive mindset also for yourself, because as a facilitator, it's, it's a very difficult job to do. So if something goes wrong in a retrospective, or isn't as constructive as you'd hoped it would be, remember the prime directive holds for you as well. You did the best you could, given the energy you had that day and the skills you had at that point. So it doesn't make sense to tell them off because they're not doing it on purpose. What makes sense is to figure out how can we change the way that we operate in this system of people so that it doesn't happen again? Can we change something in the process? Can we change something in the communication so that it's easier um, to work without making errors? So what you can do as a refactored solution is bring the prime directive to your retrospectives. You can bring it on a whiteboard or a poster. If it's an online retrospective, you can send it in an email. Sometimes I do it in the calendar invitation for the retrospective that I remind people about this. And sometimes instead of just putting the whole prime directive with the wording, I just do it in my own words. I just say, remember, we're not here to find faults in individuals. We, we are here to, to improve the thing that we have together, the system or the team. And then sometimes you have to remind those that need it because sometimes they forget it after a while. It is difficult to truly believe that everybody did the best they could, but I think it is beneficial to at least try to do that. It also makes it so that people are less worried about entering the retrospectives because they're not expecting people to try to figure out that you did something wrong. They're trying to figure out how you can work better in the future together with the other people. So that's a prime directive ignorance. The next one I want to talk about is the loud mouth. So we talk about different personalities in a retrospective and the loud mouth is one of them. And that loud mouth is one that wants to talk all the time, sometimes interrupts. And sometimes when they start talking, they can't shut up again. They just continue to talk. And the problem with the loud mouths is that they sort of, they take the floor for the whole uh, team and nobody else gets a chance to say anything. 
And if you, the anti-pattern solution is just to allow the loud mouth to talk, to allow them to speak because you think, oh, they should also speak. And I don't want to be the evil one who tells them to shut up. So the anti-pattern solution is to actually do something about it. One thing you can do is avoid plenum discussions because loud mouths thrive in plenum discussions because that's when they can take the floor and speak and nobody else can listen. So if you avoid plenum discussions, maybe if you have something online, you can put them into smaller groups and let them talk in smaller rooms. Then they only contaminate a small amount of people. And then other people can be heard as well. I also sometimes use think, pair, share, like the one, two, four, all in the liberating structures that first people have to think about things, reflect on things, and then they take talk in pairs and then perhaps they can share with the rest of the group. Because also some people are reflective thinkers, they need to think before they speak and other people are active thinkers. They can't think unless they speak. And a loud mouth could have that problem. So it could also be beneficial to talk to the loud mouth one-on-one -on -one. instead of singling them out at the retrospective and saying, shut up, uh, talk to them afterwards and say, well, it's great all these things you have to say, but perhaps, um, perhaps you can dial it down a bit because we also need to hear from other people. Loudmouths are not always aware that they are loudmouths. Sometimes they think that other people are loudmouths because they don't really have that reflection. I mean, maybe you can help them with that reflection. Maybe you can have a sign that you can use at a retrospective to say that they should now be more quiet. Sometimes it can also be helpful to let them know that they can speak later because sometimes they are worried that they, they've got something really important to say, but they, they're worried that maybe the conversation will move on and they won't have a chance. And you can just say that we'll have a round robin, we'll ask everybody in the team what they think about this. So don't worry, you'll have a chance to say something. And we can do that both online and on site. So that's the loud mouth. And actually, if you have people who are silent, it's the same situation. Avoid the plenum discussions, talk to them offline, figure out why they're silent and make them give them a chance to think before they have to speak. The next one is called do it yourself. And that's because what I see often is that it's the same person who's always facilitating the retrospectives. And if you're part of the team, for instance, if you're the scrum master and you're always the one to facilitate retrospectives, well, then the problem is that you will not get a retrospective yourself. You're too focused on facilitating the retrospective so you will not be able to be part of the team in the retrospective. So you will fail. And um, it means that you can either choose to be a facilitator or you can choose to be a team member. If you try to do both, it won't end well. You will not be looking at the timeline and the different agenda and the different personalities and the body language, or you will not be able to take part of the discussions. So what I encourage people to do is to try to rotate the role of the facilitator within the team and if that's not possible, then perhaps rotate the role of the facilitator between the teams in the organization, meaning that um, you can say, well, we have all these teams that need retrospective facilitation, and then we have this number of people who'd like to facilitate retrospectives, and then they can take turns in facilitating the retrospectives for other teams so that they can also be part of the team when there is a retrospective. And you can see what we did at one of the companies that I worked with in Denmark here, some of the teams wanted the same facilitator all the time. Some of the teams wanted a new facilitator from time to time. It really depends on the culture of the team, what they want. And if you use, um, if you use this way of facilitating where inexperienced facilitators facilitate retrospectives, I'll encourage you to use some of the online tools there are where people don't have to be experienced facilitators because um, these, these tools will take you through the process and will help you to do what a facilitator should do. So that's do it yourself. Last one I want to talk about before we dive into the questions. I can see that there is um, a lot of questions and I appreciate that. It's disregard for preparation and that holds for online retrospective. So this anti-pattern was written before COVID, but of course it's still the same. The problem with online retrospectives is that you need to prepare a lot more and you need to be very cautious about the time and you don't have a chance to look at people's body language in the same way. So what I do is that I send an email the day before with a link to the document that they should use and say, please make sure that you can access this so that we're not spending the first two or three minutes trying to figure out where's the link to that and how can I access that and do I need a password to that? Because you don't want to lose those really precious moments in your retrospective. 
send an email 15 minutes before just to remind them in 15 minutes there's a retrospective go get coffee go get a bio break and make sure that you can access the document and then insist on video for all i know that some people have problems with the technology or the internet so that they can't be on video but at least you should try to make them be on video in the beginning perhaps just for the round intro as i said they could just be on video and smile and wave and perhaps if the if the wi-fi doesn't allow it they can just have a picture um shared in the in the video tool instead of just their initials just a picture of their face is much better to talk to um, it's very important for a facilitator to know the body language and to be able to evaluate the body language and interpret the body language of the of the people who are in the retrospective. So that's why, as a facilitator, you can say, please be on video. And I, I would really like you to be on video because it will make my life a whole lot easier to see who needs to answer, ask a question, who's very angry and who, who's sort of lost interest in everything. It's very important to be able to evaluate this as a facilitator, but also for the other team members. So insist on video for all. And it's the same with the symptoms and the causes. So sometimes people don't want to be in video and they have a real good reason for it. But otherwise, sometimes it's just a symptom of something else. Like I'm taking the retrospective from the car or cafe. Then the fact that they're not on video is a symptom that they don't really respect this time with their team members. And make sure everybody's equal. So even though it's tempting, if some people can sit together, that they should sit together physically and the others are remote, try to make everybody equal. If somebody's remote, make everybody remote because then the, the commonality is, is the lowest denominator for the communication and some people are not better equipped to communicate than others. There's nothing worse than being a small video at the top of a room and trying to shout to other people and get their attention while they're having a nice cozy conversation. So make sure people are equal. And if there's only one person who has to be um, remote, then you can use an avatar. You can have somebody in the room playing their avatar, writing the post-it notes for them, showing on the camera the things that we're looking at. But that's only if it's one person. If it's more than one, it becomes difficult. And prepare a strict agenda and an alternative. Because as I said before, with the circles and soup, sometimes you need to change the things that you prepared. Maybe you have to change from plenum discussion to smaller discussions or to something written because there's a loud mouth or there are silent ones or people don't want to say anything. Maybe you want to use that soup exercise. So, so you have to plan this a bit more when it's online because you have to prepare these online documents. And don't record it, just don't. Because we want what happens in the retrospective to stay in the retrospective, so don't record it. We want people to feel um, safe and that they can trust the system and say what they want, even the negative things. So that's the disregard for preparation. And I think that now, uh, when you facilitate retrospectives, people will be really happy. And now with the, with the final slide of 35% uh, of my book, I would like to look at the questions and see, have you seen any questions, Debbie, that you think would be interesting to answer? I haven't had a chance to look at them that much. Uh, the first one is, is it always an interesting one? It's a, it's a goodie, a goodie, but not an oldie, but a goodie. What are the techniques to use in a team where most of them are reluctant to provide inputs and what we get as data points are appreciations, but the problems are never revealed. Yeah, so I, I think I've sort of, I think I've sort of answered it throughout the talk, but I can summarize that you have to think about what is the cause uh, behind this, because the symptom you see is that people are not sharing. If the cause is that they are worried, they're shy, there's not enough psychological safety, then you can either anonymize it, that's a quick fish, fix, on this so that people can say things without anybody else knowing who it is saying it. And you could, of course, also work with the psychological safety or the trust. That's something that you have to work on. It takes a bit of time. And I think there's somebody saying that maybe we can we can say in the beginning of the retrospective, we can evaluate the trust. How, how relaxed do you feel about sharing things? And if people don't want to share anything, then you could either say, well, let's focus this retrospective on how to build the, the trust. Or you can say, well, we can't really have the retrospective now if nobody wants to share anything but if the cause is that they forget things and they don't um they don't remember what happened in the last two weeks then you can ask them asynchronously or send them an email a day before and say 
look in your calendar and think about things that happened, incidents that happened. Uh, you could also say, well, maybe you change the way that you collect the data. Maybe you change to a different way of data gathering, or maybe you change it to a way where they're just voting for how they feel about the technical excellence and things like that, instead of having to write. So those are some things, depending again on the course, it always depends. That's a, a fantastic answer. Thanks for that, um, I know. And lastly, before we finish the session today, there's one on the question list, which is again, another really good one. Um, retrospectives are effective only when leadership looks at them. How do you get willful defaulters in leadership to actually look at them? What I think this means is that retrospectives are only effective when leadership accepts them and thinks that the team should spend time on them. That would be one interpretation of this question. And the answer then would be that I think that you should, if make retrospectives with the leadership team and let them try it out themselves instead of having them look at what the teams are doing in the retrospectives. Have, have them taste uh, the dog food. And uh, that's what I do in some organizations that instead of just having retrospectives for the developers, I have retrospectives for, for the leaders because then they can see themselves how effective it is. I don't want uh, people from leadership necessarily to take part in retrospectives and look at what's happening in retrospectives. I want retrospectives be, to be for the teams to change the things that the teams can change. If leadership needs to change something based on what comes out of the retrospective, I'll ask the team if I, as a facilitator, can take these proposals to the leadership and ask them if they want to change that. I think that's a, that's a brilliant answer. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. It's about retrospectives. Um, you know, throughout the organisation, no matter what, what, in quotes, level we're at, um, it should be a practice that, that's common throughout. So that's fabulous. Thank you so much, Ina, for sharing your experience. I know I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, know I love your graphics. Those are going to remain in, in, my, in my mind as, as those prompts, those anti-patterns. Thanks, Ina.